All right, welcome back to the AI for Healthcare Summit. I hope you're having an amazing time so far. Our next panel is titled Developments in AI for Pharma. Please join me in welcoming our panelists to the virtual stage. Take it away, Belen. Thank you, Patrika. Uh, I'm really looking forward to a fun conversation with my distinguished uh, colleagues. I feel really delighted to join the conversation and maybe add uh, a few points uh, from my perspective. And I want to thank Patrick and the organizers for capturing really the diversity uh, in terms of our backgrounds, where we come from, and how we are really aiming to contribute to the domain of AI uh, in pharma. So I think that is essential to have a fun conversation uh, by sharing diverse uh, backgrounds, perspectives, and then hopefully add something uh, to the audience. So uh, I, I would like to go uh, around the table uh, quickly for uh, introduction. So I will hand it over to Xiao Ying for a quick introduction and then Tomas, and then I'll introduce myself, then we'll continue with the questions. Lance, thank you so much. And first of all, thank you for the organizers to have this exciting panel coming up. And uh, uh, my name is Xiao Ying Wu. I'm currently uh, Vice President for Jensen R&D Data Science, leading the data platform and privacy organization. Uh, my background is a physician by training with computer science and biostatistics. I uh, have over 20 years of experience in the industry. And um, my recent uh, you know, accomplishment is really building the data science ecosystem for Jensen R&D, um, trying to link preclinical data, clinical data, and real world data to enable our data science um, activities and have impact on R&D at a scale. And pass the word to Tamar. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Uh, thank you for the invitation. My name is uh, Tamar Shalomusek. I lead the data science team within the digital medicine uh, and translational imaging group at Pfizer. My team is responsible for end-to-end -end development um, and deployment of digital endpoints in clinical trials. Um, and I'm an MD PhD by background. Um, since we're here, you know, uh, we're, we're hiring at all levels. <laughs> I wanted to use this page. Um, I'm sure everyone is hiring in the data science at this point, but if you're interested in, in any position, please feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Thank you. Uh, uh, Thomas, th thank you. We're all hiring indeed because, you know, talent is not easy to come by in the domain of uh, data science and machine learning. Uh, so my name is Bulent Kazultan. I'm currently the uh, head of uh, causal and predictive analytics at the AI Innovation Lab at Novartis. And the AI Innovation Lab is strategically placed at the intersection of academia, tech and pharma, which is, I believe, essential to really drive innovation in a regulated domain such as pharma and we'll have plenty of time to talk about you know the pros and cons of working in a regulated domain how it really adds contributes or maybe prevents ai from progressing and making an impact immediately uh, i am an astrophysicist by training and in that domain uh, i was teaching at harvard and mit uh, and then i made the transition to the industry to basically do um, uh, data science and machine learning and in, in the uh, academic domain, what we essentially were doing uh, in astrophysics was combining uh, data coming from different modalities, if you will, and try to extract that information, combine it with domain expertise, and come up with predictions, which in essence, even though astrophysics might look very different from what we're doing today uh, on the methodology side is, is very similar. And there are actually uh, some uh, innovative approaches that uh, scientists from different domains, including astrophysics, has, have developed, which we use uh, to drive innovation in, in our current domain. Um, so maybe we can go ahead with the first question, uh, Patrika. Um, and I think the uh, um, question is, is there a debate to AI's role in the future of drug development or is the writing on the wall and AI is destined to become a critical pillar of any discovery process? I'll, I'll, uh, do you want to dump, uh, jump in, Tomash or uh, Xiao Ying? Uh, maybe I can start um, um, the question and uh, feel free to jump in because all of us had a lot of experience and uh, reflection on this. Uh, data science is definitely a new concept, but it's now new in the space, has been there for quite some time. And I don't think there's any doubt that AI will play a key role to accelerate drug discovery and development. 
and actually has already become a critical pillar of discovery development process. You know, if you think about it, you know, from target identification, validation, lead selection, um, to uh, trial recruitment, clinical supply, uh, forecasting, as well as uh, most importantly, I think, uh, Tomas, you can speak about that is the, you know, alternative clinical endpoints, right? Just to name a few there. So I do see there's a huge, huge impact on R&D. And uh, I think we just got to start it on the journey. Yeah. Can't you read more? Go ahead, Tomas. Uh, yeah, it's, it's all, all great points. I think um, obviously it's not going. I, I can. It's obviously it's not going to be without some challenges, right? For for an industry as conservative and highly regulated as, as pharma, um, it, it, it's it's going to be a dramatic shift. And I, I know that some companies, a lot of the pharma companies, are already underway in the transformation, but we're we're probably still uh, fairly early on. I would say the same way as we started digital transformation, we're probably facing another transformation in the AI. ML and, and deep learning space. Um, but a lot of, so it's exciting thanks to, to be working on that kind of forefront of, of that uh, research. Yeah, absolutely. I want to kind of uh, go into the question for, from three different perspectives. One of them is the machine learning side of things. The technology is evolving at a light speed. I mean, there's no question what is very relevant and cutting edge today might become irrelevant nine months down the road. So the technology is moving at light speed and many domains, including pharma, is trying to keep up. So in, in many global studies, what we've seen over and over is that this uh, you know, technology capacity is only uh, one part of the whole equation to reach success in AI implementation and execution. And uh, you know, for people who are coming from you know, a scientific background, we sometimes don't think enough about culture, about leadership, uh, about operational uh, excellence in organizations. And what we see in those global studies is the company culture and the leadership profile who really uh, builds the, uh, uh, the policies for implementation play a critical role in data science and AI success when it comes to uh, uh, larger companies, especially in a field like pharma where you know, regulation is heavy on the drug development side we certainly need to uh, take this into account in building our strategies moving forward. And what I've seen in, in, in the healthcare domain, biotech domain, and uh, pharma domain is companies sometimes overestimate the short-term impact of machine learning and underestimate the long-term potential impact of AI. So, uh, you know, taking everything into account, I think uh, AI and machine learning is a long-term journey. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. But uh, the fact of the matter is uh, AI and data science operations have to show value in the short term as well in order to really convince their stakeholders, colleagues, and business units uh, to continue to invest. So it, it's kind of uh, up to the leader how to articulate that value in the short term, but also build a strategy that will bring about the long-term full potential, I think, in AI. Any, any more inputs from your perspective? Have you uh, run into those challenges? I'm sure you did. So what are some of the solutions that you uh, came up with in pushing your colleagues and stakeholders? I think uh, we are preaching to the choir here. No, none of us will say AI uh, is not here to stay because we are evangelizing AI in our, or, or our own organizations. But how do you come up with solutions in convincing them and taking them along the journey? Tomas? I'll, I'll put you on the spot. Okay, I, I think uh, this is a good question. I think just the staying competitive is what will force uh, everyone to like move at the kind of speed of light here and and um, embrace some of the AI ML approaches. Um, I mean, we can we can see I'm sure internally within our companies and across the industry a lot of investment in that space. Um, and just to you know, in an effort to keep up, I think. Uh, everyone will be forced, right, to uh, to to come along. And I think there's uh, regulators probably play regulatory agencies play an important role in that space as well, right? Because they have to provide some guard, guard, guardrails for the development and may um, and may show some or maybe may 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 push the realization of the potential for us as well. Um, 
Yeah, I just want to add one more thing. Um, you know, from internal perspective, when we're thinking about data science and data science impact and R&D, we need to be like laser focused on the priorities because there are so many unsolved problems in R&D and we all have very limited resources. So making sure you focus on the priorities, making sure you're understanding the business, making sure you are uh, understanding what we want to go and focus your resources on that and to drive the business impact. And uh, as Tomas uh, you know, said also, external involvement is also very important. Um, data science is only one piece of the puzzle of the whole R&D engine, right? And we need to work with our external partners. We need to work with our regulators, bring them to the table as early as possible. Um, as we all can see, FDAs and other health authorities, they have been selling out all these industry guidelines, draft guidelines. So making sure we all get together, making sure we provide our input into the regulation um, you know, uh, guidelines, making sure we all working on the same uh, goal as well. So um, I think you mentioned one thing touched me is the technology has been evolving quickly. And how can we make, you know, catch up the wave? How can we bring our house, you know, authorities uh, catch up the wave? Um, so that's a lot of, need a lot of collaboration, a lot of talking, a lot of, uh, you know, um, kind of working with hand, like working with them hand to hand and making sure we all go to the same uh, destination, which is actually helping our patients along the way as well. Yeah. As, you, as you said, Xiaoing, you know, uh, bringing, uh, our uh, colleagues along the journey, I think is essential. This is why leaders who can tell the right story with the light, right wording is very important. Uh, that's why we need uh, leaders who can have multiple heads. And I'm, I'm glad to sit here in the panel with people who have very strong technical expertise, but also understand the business needs, but also have an insight into where the AI wave is going. So we can not only catch up with the wave, but hopefully we can ride the wave as, as a leader in, in our companies. I think that is essential. But one thing that I will even push further, what you said, Xiaoing, uh, you know, certainly we need to be laser focused on the business needs. But, you know, when we look at the high level, you know, what drives innovation is if we just leave the uh, use cases uh, uh, form and shape our AI strategy, uh, I believe, strongly believe that the long term impact will be diminished. So we need to, as AI organizations, go as equals to the table with our uh, stakeholders and business units and not only take their priorities, deliver them in the short term. But once we establish uh, credibility with them, we need to go back to the table and say, well, the technology enables you to, to, to do X, Y, and Z, which you may not have considered. And we've done that over and over. Certainly there is a lot of inertia coming from business units because we push them out of their comfort zone to really consider alternatives like using Google Trends, like using uh, NLP techniques with sentiment analysis, which they're not used to, to understand disease progression and biology, right? This, this is not intuitive. So I think once we as AI leaders go to the table as equals, uh, once we establish our credibility, we can really push it to the next level and not let the use cases alone dictate our long-term strategy. So this is my perspective. Thank you for sharing that. Okay. I think I wanted to add, it's an important point actually that, you know, the, and I think, uh, you, know, you mentioned that, uh, when, when we chatted before is the empowerment of the data science organization within the overall structure so that we have, um, kind of an equal, equal, um, seat at the table with all the other parts of the organization because it's support, but also to your point, kind of driving the, the vision and uh, being able to anticipate some of the industry trends as well. Um, and yeah, that's very interesting. I, I was to um, I was impressed actually by how um, how when when J and J appointed a chief data science officer because I think that kind of elevated that uh, the importance of data science in, in the pharma space. That that is exactly a very clear sign of the empowerment. And I always say, if a data science uh, operations are not empowered from the very top, it's uh, um, very difficult to push through from bottom up. And I want to also emphasize, um, you know, to be at the table as early as possible. And also when we recruit our teams, uh, making sure we find bilingual 
uh, talent, which is even harder. Um, but that's true because data science in farm is not just data science, it's the science and data science. And, you know, data science is a human endeavor. So we need uh, people <laughs> with te deep technical expertise and soft skills uh, at the same time. It's, it's a very difficult combination to come by uh, to Thomas's point where we're all hiring, looking for top talent. But this is a good segue to the second question. Uh, so the second question is tell me about a time when you notice the impact AI will have on pharma companies, whether related to discovery, general operations, trial, or other areas. Any of you want to pick this up? I, I can jump in directly by saying, you know, on, on the uh, operational efficiency side, there are always low hanging fruits. Uh, that, that's what we've seen over and over. Uh, lots of uh, operational pipelines um, may still operate with Excel sheets with, with uh, manual uh, uh, predictive processes and with uh, a trivial implementation of AI and automation, I think the uh, uh, efficiency can be increased significantly. We've seen this over and over. The gain and impact is very real. Uh, on and you know, in, in for for people who don't know, in the pharma space, uh, we sometimes divide the whole pipeline into drug discovery and drug development. And on the discovery side, we you know, our biologists, a scientist, medical doctors, clinicians are trying to understand the disease, the biology, uh, to come up with compounds or assets, as we call them in the pharma space. And then that molecule gets shipped to the uh, drug development uh, 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 portion of, of the exercise. And then clinical trials come about, regulatory uh, interface comes about, and it's a whole different process. So what I've seen is when it comes to AI making an impact is on the certain operational side, uh, there are immediately uh, 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 low-hanging fruits where impact can be made. On the discovery side, uh, which is not always uh, um, regulatory heavy, if you will, uh, it's, it's not uh, really going through the clinical trials, but there are some early discoveries where we work with scientists hand in hand. And typically what we see is uh, the uh, playing field for uh, AI is very wide. So we can really implement an experiment with cutting edge AI technologies to uh, combine different modalities of data, genomics, MRI images, if you will, uh, some uh, other uh, information that we can combine using that technology, which uh, for me appears to be uh, easier. So the impact is real and it's, it's closer. Uh, on the development side, which is very uh, conservative uh, for natural reasons, they interface with the regulators, uh, the general mindset, the biomarkers, the endpoints uh, are well defined. It's a harder and more difficult journey. And uh, when I interact with my colleagues uh, coming from the drug development side, I go to the table by saying the best machine learning starts with non-machine learning. So we, we as people who are using those technologies, we really need to appreciate the um, contributions that standard statistics has done. And we really need to understand what we can do with them before jumping to the next level of sophistication or a black box technology. And certainly when we want to implement certain technologies in the clinical trial setting, uh, we need to be transparent and they need to be explainable, which is another uh, layer uh, of sophistication and complexity, I think. So, so the um, uh, potential for AI to make an impact there is a little bit delayed, but we're just, uh, 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 starting with it, I think we're just seeing the top of the iceberg. Um, also, what I think is when uh, companies are well aligned, uh, top to bottom and bottom up, uh, they are empowered from the top, but they have the talent, infrastructure and resources on the ground. I think uh, those companies are destined to make an impact with AI. Uh, certainly companies that adapt to this new reality uh, and they will become basically leaders. They have to become leaders. They cannot just try to you know, catch the wave, but they need to ride the wave in order to uh, continue the long-term impact. And the companies that uh, remain conservative, I think will become obsolete, but that's my uh, subjective perspective. Yeah, I can, um, well said, I can also add a few examples. I think there's many examples. Um, you know, we see the, the first the AI designed the drug uh, candidates actually enter into the clinic, which is a huge, right? And we also see using external control arms, um, you know, as a part of the successful, you know, regulatory submissions. 
But uh, most recently, um, you know, we see the, the AI actually and data science actually have made impact on the COVID vaccine development as, as well. You know, we've been using the, uh, the collecting the data and also understanding how COVID-19 will be spreading worldwide and will it going to be a likely uh, spike next, right? And where it going to be potentially for uh, variants to emerge. Uh, those predictions actually proven to be extremely accurate. And uh, we use that to enable us to place the clinical trial sites at, uh, you know, at the, we, we say called the hotspot, right? And that actually results, um, shorten the vaccine development timelines and also the sample size. And also we can collect in the um, efficacy data across multiple variant when the, um, when the, when the, um, the, the spike hits as well. So I think it, there's a lot of potentials. Uh, it's really, as I, I mentioned before, uh, pick the right uh, you know, business um, pipelines, um, making sure the priorities, making sure we see the you know, data science impact on the program success as well. Uh, for me, I'm, there's, there's so many watershed moments in that space, right? Um, to what Gulen said earlier, the, 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 the space is moving so quickly. It sometimes I feel like uh, we need just another job just to keep up, right, with all the development. But uh, I think one, one of the sort of breakthroughs that stuck with me was the, was the publishing of the AlphaFold uh, model by, by Google, uh, pretty much solving the, the protein folding uh, problem which uh, I think demonstrate, you know, something that would not be possible without uh, AI and all approaches, right? Um, so I think we're, we're, I think that probably demonstrated to, to, to leadership that, that there has to be an investment done in that space. Exactly, and I think we can be more specific with, you know, the areas of impact. I think the audience will be interested as well. As you said, Thomas, Alpha Fault is huge, uh, coming from DeepMind. They recently changed their uh, policy on how it can be used in the domain, which enables uh, companies to uh, use the libraries more effectively in their drug development uh, programs. Uh, certainly. Uh, doing in silico uh, a novel compound prediction is something which is called generative chemistry that I'm sure all companies are working on. And we have our own technology pipelines where we are implementing the latest and the newest and experiment and benchmark continuously try to improve. And I, I can say unequivocally that the uh, drug discovery has uh, sped up. Uh, not only we, we sp sped it up, but we also are coming up with uh, new compounds. Uh, that we can go back to the chemists, to the laboratories and uh, ask them whether it makes sense or not. So that that whole process, iterative process has really sped up considerably and it's, it's uh, just uh, going on. Um, also uh, on the feature uh, uh, prediction part, when we have certain compounds, we can predict their chemical uh, features using AI, which also uh, adds to the speed of the uh, drug uh, discovery process. And when it comes to development, certainly with clinical trials, Xiaoying has touched upon you know, external controls, uh, virtual patients, uh, simulated patients, and there comes a, a causal inference into play where I, I'm proud to say that my organization is, is probably uh, the only one, maybe a very unique organization where we really uh, announced that we focus on not only predictive analytics, machine learning, but also on causal inference. The, the, the uh, two domains have not converged uh, uh, fully yet, but it's it's uh, at the forefront of research, and I think we're bringing in the uh, a causal learning a part and really understanding the biology and disease uh, will bring in an additional value to the predictive process. I think which which is essential to really uh, talk and negotiate with the regulators pushing uh, this this whole uh, pipeline even uh, further. Okay, so maybe we can switch to uh, and transition to the next question. Uh, speaking of, uh, you know, very specific use cases, how we can use AI and machine learning to expedite certain processes within the pharma world. What are the key changes you are seeing on the back end of your organization to enable more AI-driven processes, new personnel, data projects, vendor procurement, or else? Um, and what, what I've seen over and over is uh, building on our, our strengths is critical. 
Uh, every organization has different priorities, different resources, and different strengths. This is obviously also valid for uh, the uh, teams that we work with. And, you know, as, as Thomas said, we're always looking for top talent here. And data science is an especially uh, human endeavor, I think. So uh, the added layer to this whole uh, conversation is the readiness of the infrastructure. You know, we cannot really move forward without the help of our uh, friends who are building those infrastructures for us. But I'll, I'll hand it over to you and get your perspective on this. So uh, maybe I can chime in first because um, uh, my team is actually responsible for all the data, data solutions, platforms, as well as data governance and privacy within the data science organization. Um, so I think this is a very smart move to have these organizations within data science because we work very closely with our data scientists to understanding the needs, understanding you know what are the things we can do to help them to um, scale their work, how to when we build a model, how do we how do we deploy the model in the right way as well. So one team all in and uh, side by side is definitely helps a lot. But I want to also mention one of the. Uh, challenge we all facing is actually talent, right? So how do we recruit and also retain our talent is important and crucial for the organization's success as well. And uh, especially to having people with diverse background is important. How do we find the bilingual data scientists is important um, because we do need to have people who understand science, have domain knowledge, and as well as technology and data science to make things to work and to accelerate the projects we're working on, accelerate the programs we're working on as well. So those are the key things I'm, I'm thinking, this is a super, super important, yeah. How about you, I, I think for me, one of the, um, one of the key changes is uh, probably identifying a, a strategy that works for uh, that consistently works from taking a model from from an R and D to to production, and does it mean you know is is there one team owning the it end to end, or is there is there some sort of handoff happening whether to a vendor, and if it's a vendor, you know what kind of vendor has that um, has that expertise to to keep you know every, the the process CXP compliant and SOP compliant. Um, I think this is still a learning a bit of a learning curve because you know for, for things like like class you know table for generating of clinical study reports we, we have SOPs we have a lot of experience but for for um generating those results out of AI black box models where the expectation is that we have you know everything QC and, and transparent that that there there are some challenges there and I think we have to figure out as an organization what's a good um What's a good strategy? You know, smaller single teams, or maybe you know. The, I think I, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. You know, how are you solving it internally? I, I will. I will uh, uh, just uh, quickly touch upon Xiaoying's point of talent uh, attraction and talent retention. I think this speaks to uh, the uh, previous topic I mentioned on. You know, what comes out of the global studies is the transformation of culture. Uh, how we work with data science teams, how we embed data science teams in our internal operations is, is very important, I think, in, in both aspects, uh, attraction and retention. The, the profile that we see are making an impact in data science are the creative minds. You know, there's no question. The bilingual, as Xiaoying said, you know, those are the people who are very curious by nature. They, they are quick learners but they also would like to bring that impact into the fold. So uh, typically uh, companies come from a culture where the OKRs in project management is well-defined and they tell them what to do. And you know, you are you know, very focused on the outcome and, and that's it. And uh, certainly there are, there are data science uh, teams that are embedded in business units that are focused on execution and delivery. But I see that there is a different flavor in data science, which is the R&D end of things. And, and you know, that's where most of the uh, uh, creative minds feel at home. But we know for practical reasons, we cannot be an academic institution. We cannot do R&D for the sake of doing R&D. It needs to be really well tied into the business priorities. And I think it mm. is up to the leader to articulate that point, to build that bridge, 
to speak the language of both sides and make it happen. So this is why the second uh, important thing, like the uh, leadership profile becomes very, very important. And what I've seen is certainly, you know, depending on the data science uh, unit uh, under which it lives, uh, whatever their priorities are, having an optimal blend of R&D and execution and leveraging and finding that balancing point that can really um, help your data science teams to grow. And growing is so essential. If they don't grow, they will become obsolete in six to nine months, giving them the incentive to grow, but converting that capability built into value and impact, I think is where the uh, key is for success. And I think, you know, overall, we're all struggling. We come with a very limited background, our own perspectives. And this is why the leadership profile uh, has to be uh, learning, bringing in that learning and curiosity culture into the fold where everybody learns from everybody rather than, you know, like a top down decision making. I typically built my roadmaps with my team in a workshop rather than telling them what we need to do. Uh, and I also try to create incentives for them to build their own projects and then go through a rigorous uh, process where we tie those innovative ideas to business priorities and make an impact. And once they see that they can make it make an impact, I think retention becomes less of a problem. Okay, so let's make a transition to the fourth question. How do you expect pharma to adopt AI moving forward? And what do you expect to be the cutting edge of AI in the next five years? And it puts me a smile on my face. I cannot predict what the cutting edge will be in six months, let alone five years. Uh, but I'll 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 dive in later. But I'll 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 give the floor to Xiaoying and Tomas. Um, so in my personal view, um, there are two things. One is the digital endpoints in clinical development, and the other is AI as a part of a um, design of every new drugs um, in the discovery. So. Uh, the second one, I think I touched a little bit, and you guys also mentioned a little bit as well at the beginning of our uh, panel, um, because the advantage advancement in technology will see more uh, in silico drug design in the future, and that will be a big trend in you know down the road for sure. But I want to focus on more on the digital uh, endpoints uh, perspective um, because we all see the evolution of wearables, the sensor devices. They are collecting the data outside, you know, the clinical uh, setting, as well as, you know, we see the digital solutions uh, has been uh, widely adopted in the clinical practice as, as well. So, for example, using biopsies, using uh, medical imaging for early diagnosis, um, which enable us to find a new ways of, uh, you know, predicting disease onsite, right, monitoring the disease progression and also monitoring the treatment response in the clinical trials. And uh, with COVID-19 uh, pandemics actually, it serves as a catalyst itself for uh, we see more and more of uh, home care, we see more and more tele, you know, um, telehealth, we see more remote patient uh, you know, monitoring and screening um, and implementation of decentralized clinical trials has been taking a high, you know, on the, on the, on the trends as well. Um, and data, if you think about the data, data generating from those devices are being growing rap rapidly as, you know, and then we can use AI and the machine learning to answer questions, which is uh, previously think is uh, impossible to answer. And, uh, and also can fill the, the gaps in terms of uh, how do we measure clinical um, endpoints. You know, clinical measurement is hard to measure. And uh, yeah. yeah, so these digital endpoints are more objective and can be done as much greater frequency uh, compared to the existing um, clinical endpoints. So I do see, um, you know, this space will be grow and uh, um, mean, and also mean um, like more concrete in the next, uh, you know, few years. I only hope that's true because that's, <laughs> I, I sure hope so. That uh, I, I agree. I wholeheartedly agree uh, with Chen. With Chen, definitely. Um, I think if I would add, if I would, if I would add to that, is uh, maybe we'll see more kind of AI ML based uh, SAND software as medical devices. Um, there's some, you know, the FDA is proposing some frameworks, um, especially if. Um, 
especially if we, you know, as, as kind of as a follow up to those endpoints, we may we may see them not only used in a clinical trial, but also in uh, maybe as companion apps, digital diagnostics, um, post market surveillance, and and if 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 AI models are deployed in a kind of in the real world environment, they will also have to be made adaptive. And that that's might be um, an interesting area uh, for, for us in the next couple of years, building adaptive AI models and how the, um, how the regulatory agencies would accept uh, a, a device that potentially is changing based on the inputs and what's, what's the, what does it mean in terms of safety profile and, and acceptance. Uh, but on the plus side, you know, maybe it would open those, um, those diagnostic or uh, predictive tools to, to wider populations um, and make them more um, you know, real-world evidence-based uh, versus you know, classic uh, clinical trial settings. And I think the, the, one, um, the other question that I would have is maybe, you know, do you, from, on my end, do you think that we'll see more you know, commoditization of, of data science? I mean, there's, you know, now and then you see articles that, you know, data science will be obsolete. Data scientists will be out of jobs in like two or three years, right? Is that, is that realistic? Especially, you know, with the answer, like things like auto ML uh, approaches, right? Which might take away some of that um, um, sophistication or, or the expertise required to build those models. Do you, do you think that's happening? Let me pick up on auto ML. Uh, auto ML, I think, uh, can expedite certain processes that we talked about, like in the operational end, it can empower data scientists that are tasked with delivery. Uh, and, you know, we are, and I have worked in the past in creating some of those auto ML algorithms. And I, I can, I can tell you that uh, it will not make data scientists obsolete as, as an uh, uh, ex astronomer, if you will. But I'll, I'll add two, two uh, points to the question. Um, and I'll, I'll speak a little machine learning here. Obviously, you know, you, you gave us, you know, a fantastic overview of the pharma side of things and what might become important. So everything that we do essentially boils down to combining data coming from different streams and we call them multimodal. Different modalities are coming in. We're trying to effectively and efficiently combine them and come up with some sort of a prediction, right? So um, this requires us to first explore um, cutting edge technologies by which we can combine different modalities. And I think, you know, looking at how the technology is evolving, how those uh, uh, methods are evolving, uh, either variational autoencoders, transformers, or even contrastive methods, uh, you know, they work really effectively and efficiently combining different modalities uh, to make a forward prediction. Now there is technology which you can use for multimodal prediction which does backward prediction as well, which means, you know, all your data obviously is not homogenized. They are sometimes sparse. It makes backward prediction and what's missing in the data and adjust probabilistically the future prediction. So this is another uh, layer of that technology. But the critical bottleneck for all of us, especially in healthcare and uh, biotech and pharma is we don't have as much data as we like to have it. Right. And this is why we're coming up with generating data. We're coming up wearables. We're just trying to create additional data to feed our data hungry algorithms. So I will add another speculative layer and say the next wave in machine learning will not be big data, but it will be small data, how we can really extract efficient and effective uh, predictions from small data. And there are lots of indications that you know, we are currently combining applied mathematical techniques to increase the efficiency of the algorithms that we currently use that are very data hungry so that they can operate in the small data regime. And I'll, I'll leave it there. Yeah, I think you said very well. Um, and uh, um, it's a very hard, complex question to answer, especially in R&D. Um, so maybe that's also one of the challenges we're seeing the, you know, how do we see data science impact on R&D as well, right? So um, collecting modality, the multimodal data is important um, and to answer the, you know, the biology questions from those data is crucial. Yes. Um, and especially if you look at, if you can get um, data collected on the same 
participants or patient uh, from all the modality data is even harder, right? So um, I think there is definitely an opportunity for the uh, AI and the machine learning uh, field to um, develop a new algorithm, to develop a new uh, approach to analyzing this type of data, to analyze, to um, pick up the signals from diverse data, data assets, uh, you know, to support those uh, biologic questions. Um, and the other things we, we also want to pay attention is a uh, very commonly used the term digital twin. Uh, of course, that thing is actually uh, sometimes overused, I, I, I have to say, but uh, uh, definitely give um, some thoughts in the, you know, for the people, for the, you know, for all our um, scientists in the space to think about how can we leverage digital twin to simulate, to predict, uh, to identify new signals um, for especially for disease progression and how the uh, how the mechanism behind all the um, you know um, treatment effects and also predict the, um, the disease progression as well. That, that's right. Tomas, uh, anything uh, you might want to add to this? To back. Digital twins comes about all the time, and I'm sure every company is working on it. But there are very simplistic approaches, and there are very sophisticated ones. You know, we interact with a lot of companies that have those platforms. But, you know, uh, at the end of the day, we are trying to build a prediction and simulate uh, a data which you know, comes back to the question, you know, we, we don't have enough data to really leverage some of the technology. So either we need to innovate new algorithms or we need to come up with approaches which can leverage uh, a, a smaller amounts of data to give us really valuable predictions. But but go ahead, Tomas. That's an interesting point. Uh, now and then a simulation comes up because, you know, obviously a lot of data in, in, in pharma is already simulated and they're established, well-designed, well approved processes. And then the business asks us, you know, why do you have to run a study in humans? Why don't you just simulate that? <laughs> because, you know, it's really hard, right? We don't have the data. We don't have enough data to, to even start simulating it. Um, but uh, that, these are some interesting challenges. For some of the cases, I feel that, you know, creating a, a simulated data would, would almost cost us as much effort as just going and instrumenting a real participants in the clinical trial. But uh, it's also a question, you know, how the regulatory agency would see the data that hasn't been collected in, in, in human, human participants. But there's, it, I, I was just, you know, it resonated with me, the, the thought about simulation, because it comes up uh, fairly often. Yeah, a, a part of that uh, a simulation exercise, I think, again, I, I will come back to uh, going beyond correlations, uh, which we currently are using all the time in statistics and machine learning, and really understand the causal relationships. This is very important to understand biology. This is incredibly important to understand disease and progression, but it's even more important when you're filing anything to the regulators, you need to make the point that, you know, whatever you're seeing, you understand at the fundamental level. And this is where causal discovery, causal inference will become and is becoming very, very important in, in all those different aspects of, of the technology. And you know, I will just uh, uh, go back to one of the things that I've said is we need to continue to build on our strengths. And this is also valid at the company level. Uh, you know, we need to uh, really work uh, as a community to change the mindset of uh, our companies. And sometimes that's very difficult. They come from a very conservative background where everything is kept internal. And then you really don't interact with the outside world for IP reasons, for commercial reasons. This does not really work well with uh, a, a domain such as data science where everything moves so quickly and it's a community effort. So one thing that I have been doing is to articulate the point that doing open science when it comes to data science and AI, uh, developing certain algorithms or uh, using algorithms in an innovative setting in a new experiment is innovation as well. And then sharing that with the community as much as possible to get feedback and then implement the next level of uh, innovation internally brings in a, a lot of value and impact. So uh, it, it's up to the leaders really to create that ecosystem where data science teams are really interconnected with the AI domain, with academia, with tech, and with their internal partners as well. So communication, collaboration, 
And pushing that uh, uh, curiosity and learning culture, I think, is essential for the future of AI anywhere, especially in pharma. We cannot remain isolated and hope to be leaders in AI and pharma, I think. And I'll end okay. it here. Uh, I, I just want to hear your uh, uh, final thoughts, and then I'll hand it to Patrika. Um, thank you. Uh, this is a great, great panel. I enjoyed it very much. And thank you for the organizers to uh, make this happen as well. Yes, thank you for having me and uh, excellent uh, closing statement. I agree. It was a fun conversation. I'm looking forward to catching up in person with all of you. And I'll hand it over to Patrika. Thank you. Amazing panel. This was an incredible conversation. I know this virtual audience is going wild with virtual applause. Thank you all so much. And a special thank you to Pulen for moderating for us. That was awesome. And it's, it's our pleasure having you. And for the audience, it's time for you to make your way to your next session. Along the way, make sure you accept your connection request and take some time to check out our amazing exhibits. Thanks so much, and we'll see you around.